Have you ever needed to annotate a video? You know, zoom in or out, add a spotlight effect, or use an arrow, a circle, or a line to emphasize part of an image or a technique you're demonstrating. Well, in this tutorial, I reveal step-by-step -step how to create these three effects in your videos. Plus, if you stick around to the very end, I'll show you how to sidestep all the heavy lifting and download the assets we create today for free. I'm David Power, and this is a DaVinci Resolve Power Tip. So the first annotation technique we'll look at is the zoom effect. Let's start by dragging a still image onto the timeline. It goes without saying, your underlying clip does not have to be a still image. In fact, in most cases, it will be video. But just to ensure everything plays back smoothly during this tutorial, I'm using a still image of a checkout page. And I'll stretch it out along the timeline to give us some space to work with. Next, let's open the effects library and drag an adjustment clip onto the timeline above the clip we want to annotate. As a side note, I've set up my adjustment clips to default to six seconds in length. You may need yours to be longer or shorter, so it's a good idea to start this process by determining how long you want the effect to last and adjusting your clip length accordingly. Next, select the adjustment clip with your mouse and open the inspector pane. To create a zoom effect, we're going to set keyframes on the zoom and position parameters right here under the transform section. Starting with the playhead at frame zero, I'll set keyframes at the default positions of 1.0 for zoom and 0.0 for position X and position Y. I like my zooms to take place over one second, but you should feel free to make yours faster or slower to suit your use case. As a pro tip, you can move your playhead forward one second by hitting shift and right arrow together on your keyboard. I'm on a 24 frames per second timeline, so my playhead is now on frame 24. Here, I'll change my zoom setting to 2.0. Another quick side note, there's no right or wrong value for the zoom setting, so you're free to set it to any value you want. But with 1080p footage, I try not to go much higher than 1.5 or 2.0 as a maximum because the underlying footage tends to get noticeably pixelated. With 4K footage, you can easily zoom in by a factor of two and maybe even three or four if you absolutely have to. Just be aware, the further you zoom in, the more pixelated and grainy your underlying footage is going to look. Okay, so next I'll adjust my position X and Y parameters until the pricing options on the shopping cart are essentially centered in the frame. That happens close to an X value of 200 and a Y value of minus 60. Next, I'll move my cursor to the end of the adjustment clip, then hit shift and left arrow to move back one second. And without making any changes to the zoom or position parameters, I'll set keyframes here. Next, I'll move to the very end of my clip, double click the zoom label to set it back to its default value of one, and double click the position label to reset the X and Y parameters back to their default values. Notice here, Resolve automatically sets keyframes for me at this position. And let's play it back. The clip zooms in over the course of one second, holds for four seconds, and zooms out over the final second. Not too shabby. The only thing I don't like about this technique is the fact the zoom doesn't look smooth. By default, Resolve uses straight line paths between keyframes. Now it's possible to open the Retime Curve controls by clicking the curve icon on the adjustment clip and changing the zoom and position paths from linear shapes to spline shapes. But because the zoom and position changes are happening in different dimensions, here's what happens when I add curves to the paths. You see that? The pads are smooth, but they change at different rates. So the zoom effect ends up being what I like to call wonky. All this is to say, if you want a quick and dirty zoom effect, the method I just showed you will get the job done without too much effort. But if you want to step it up a notch and look super profesh, here's what I recommend. Let's get rid of this simple zoom clip and drag a new adjustment clip onto the timeline. This time we're going to play around in Fusion. But really quickly, I want to show you what might be a bug in Resolve version 16. With your cursor anywhere above the new adjustment clip, click the Fusion icon to jump to the Fusion tab. 
If you spent any time using Fusion, you know the timeline normally starts at a value of zero. But notice here, it's showing me frame 86,400. A little math will tell you that's the number of frames in one hour at 24 frames per second. Now, why it does this, I'm not certain. But the reason I think it might be a bug is this. Let's jump back to the Edit tab, and here's a workaround I've discovered. Select the adjustment clip with your mouse, open the inspector pane, and change the name of the clip to Dummy, D-U-M-M-Y. Now, I don't mean that as an insult to the adjustment clip. I'm sure it's very intelligent in its own special way. Once I've changed the name, I'll drag the dummy clip to my power bin. If your power bin isn't open, you get there by clicking View from the top menu, then Show Power Bins. Next, delete the original adjustment clip from your timeline and drag the dummy clip from your power bin back onto the timeline. Now listen, intuitively, all that renaming and dragging and dropping shouldn't make any difference. However, when we open the dummy clip in Fusion, you can now see my timeline begins at a frame of zero and goes out to 144, which is six seconds at 24 frames per second. Again, I don't know for certain if this is a bug, but the dummy clip method I just demonstrated gives us the workaround we need. Moving on. Here in the Fusion tab, I'll select the Media In node with my mouse, and then add a Transform node by clicking the Transform icon on the Fusion toolbar. With the Transform node selected, I'll move my playhead to frame zero and set keyframes at the default values for both the center parameter and the size parameter. Next, I'll move my playhead forward one second. For me, that's 24 frames. And I'll set the zoom slider to 2.0. Now, one of the big benefits of creating the zoom effect in Fusion is that you can set your position center by dragging the transform crosshairs on the viewer. I find this is a lot faster than adjusting X and Y parameters individually. So I'll drag the crosshairs so the payment options are once again in the center of the frame. Good stuff. Next, I'll move my playhead to frame 120, which for me is one second before the very last frame of my adjustment clip. And without changing the parameter values, I'll set keyframes for center and for size. Next, I'll move to the very last frame of the clip, which for me is 144. And here, I'll set the center X and Y values to their defaults of 0.5 and the size slider back to its default of 1. Fusion will automatically set keyframes for me at this position, and we're done with the keyframing. Let's play it back. So right now, this looks exactly like the previous lo-fi zoom effect we created because the motion is very linear. But because we're in Fusion, we have full control over the keyframe paths. So let's open the spline window, resize it so we can see what's going on, ensure both the size and center path checkboxes are selected, click Zoom to Fit, then click anywhere on the spline grid and hit Control A on your keyboard to select all keyframes. Then hit F to create flat spline paths. Notice how we now have nice smooth paths between the keyframes at positions 0 and 24, and again between frames 120 and 144. Now let's play this back. And as you can see, the zoom in and zoom out are much smoother than they were before. Now, one last thing we can add to amp up this effect is the smallest little bit of motion blur. So let's close the spline window, click the settings icon here in the inspector, check the motion blur checkbox, and leave all parameters at their default values. And now let's play back the zoom effect. There you go. That's a one spicy a zoom effect, don't know? Now don't forget, because this effect is inside an adjustment clip, you're free to drag it anywhere you want on the timeline, and the zoom effect goes with it. Just keep in mind, if you want to make the effect longer or shorter, you'll need to go back into Fusion and adjust the placement of your keyframes. All right, let's move on to annotation technique number two, the spotlight effect. We'll start by adding a new adjustment clip to the timeline. Place your cursor anywhere over the clip and click the color icon to jump to the color tab. Next, select the Power Window tool and activate the circle shape. 
Use your mouse to position the center of the circle over the area you want to highlight. For me, that's going to be the bump offer box in the lower left corner of the checkout page. Next, grab any one of the corner handles on the blue square and drag it in or out to increase or decrease the size of the window. If you need to, you can grab the handles in the center of the blue lines to change the shape of the window to more of an ellipse. Okay, now click the outside icon right here so that any color changes we make from this point forward affect everything outside the power window. I'll start by dropping the gain slider here on the color wheels panel down to about 0.7. And I'll drop the gamma down to about minus 20. Now be aware, there's no right or wrong values for these sliders. The levels you choose will depend on the overall brightness of the underlying clip and how much or how little you want to emphasize the area you're highlighting. So adjust the gain and gamma sliders until you're happy with the effect you're creating. Notice how the adjustments I've just made really make the bump offer pop. It would be super clear to a viewer there's something here that I wanted to highlight. The only thing I'm not happy about is the edges of the circle are a little bit too soft. We can adjust the softness with the red handles on the power window, but I find it easier just to type a value of 0.5 into the softness parameter field right here. And now let's take a closer look. Good stuff. For one final touch, let's jump back to the Edit tab and add a short fade in and fade out to the clip so the transition isn't so abrupt. I typically add somewhere between a quarter and a half a second of fade on both the head and tail of the adjustment clip. And now let's play it back. That's looking good. And for the record, you're not limited to circle shapes here. You can follow the same process to create square spotlights, or you can use the curve tool to create a custom shape that can be as freaky as you want. Just be careful not to scare the kids. Okay, next up, technique number three, transparent overlays. For this technique, we need some external assets. So I've created some hand-drawn doodle images and converted them to transparent PNG format. To kick things off, I'll drag this red arrow to my timeline. Notice how it expands to fill the entire screen. That's the default behavior, so don't get freaked out. Let's start by selecting the image with your cursor and opening the inspector pane. Because the arrow is far too big right now, let's adjust the zoom parameter to shrink it down to a useful size. Let's also adjust the angle. You'll find these types of annotations stand out a little better when they're not perfectly aligned or perfectly vertical or horizontal. So we'll put a little angle on this by adjusting the rotation angle slider to about minus 30-ish. Next, I'll adjust the X and Y position values until the arrow points at the what you get area of the checkout page. Keep in mind it's possible to animate the arrow so it moves from one place to another simply by setting keyframes on the position X and position Y values. I won't cover that in this tutorial, but feel free to experiment with it on your own. Once you finish sizing and positioning the arrow, let's add a little fade in and fade out. Again, I usually make this somewhere between a quarter of a second and a half a second on either side. And now let's play this back. And as you can see, the arrow fades in, stays in position, and fades out at the end. And if you'd prefer to use a circle or an underlying doodle instead of the arrow, You'll follow the exact technique to size and position the PNG image where you want it to appear in the video frame. And this is how they look upon playback. The circle and the underline. So we've just covered three different annotation techniques. But where things really get interesting is when you combine the techniques together. For instance, you can layer an arrow on top of a spotlight on top of a zoom and get an effect like this. All you need to do is adjust the timing and length of each clip so they fade in and out at the right times. Oh, and one more thing. Think of this as a bonus tip. Once you created your annotation assets, you can drag them to your power bin, and they'll be ready to drag and drop into future projects. Now, it goes without saying. You'll very likely need to adjust the positions, sizes, and lengths of each of these effects to suit your project, 
but you can use what we've created today as a solid starting point. And some more good news, the download for this tutorial includes the zoom effect, the spotlight effect, plus the arrow, circle, and underline doodles in transparent PNG format. And they're all available for you to use in your own projects. And boom! Now you can add profesh-looking annotations to your videos with all that sweet drag-and-drop goodness. As I promised, you can download the assets we created today, plus a bunch of others from past and future tutorials at drfreebies.com. And if you use these assets in a project of your own, be sure and apply the hashtag drfreebies so I can follow your work and check out your mad video skills, yo! If you have questions, let me know in the comments, and if you're digging these power tips, you know what to do. With the buttons and the bells and the clicking and the smashing. Thanks for watching. Once again, I'm David Power, and I'll see you in the next Power Tip.